Jeff Lucas, uh, the Lucas Group from Adelaide, of course, the hub of uh, Australia. Um, question to Alistair Davison. The, um, we've heard it several times today uh, about the average farm cropping income as $318,000 per farm. But the thing it hasn't given us, and that's an improvement from previous years, there's been an increase in farm size as well. Can you give us some sort of indication of the increase in farm size over that time? Um, look, the, the, the question's a very valid one, and it's um, one that we wrestled with. Um, I could have equally said that it was the, uh, the highest farm cash income for the last 40 years. Um, the point being that as you get structural adjustment and you get farms expanding, you would expect the, um, the farm cash income to go up. Probably the best way to think about it, uh, there's, there's no easy um, quick answer to the question, but I guess I could make a few points which start to form a picture. So um, the first thing is that uh, a, a good measure is also um, return on capital invested. Now that, to some extent, if you like, starts to uh, to net out the, the you know the, the larger farm size, and and that varies a lot more. That's not um, a monotonic, uh, you know, a straight increasing uh, curve over time. Certainly, over the last five or eight years, we've seen an increasing return on capital on average. That's um, including. Uh, um, land appreciation. Um, it's a little flatter when you don't count that. Another measure that's um, quite useful is, to think about is the, um, the uh, uh, some sort of profit increase, if you like, um, profit as a return of receipts. And uh, that's been increasing in recent years. So I don't, uh, that starts to form a picture, but you, it's, it's a good one to, to think of it from a, a perspective of several metrics to, rather than just relying on farm cash income. Yeah. Just there, in the middle. <laughs> <It's a rough laughs> happens to be the equidistant from everyone. <clears throat> Hi there, um, Eric Parnas is my name. I work in Primary Industries and Regions SA. Question for Alistair. Um, I was looking at some data the other day from the ABS about um, wheat exports um, from South Australia, the value of wheat exports, and over the year um, it had gone down and gone down, you know, a reasonable amount, which sort of was a bit surprising given, you know, the the record harvest and the um, the the farm incomes that you're talking about, and obviously there's. Uh, a price effect going on to, to some extent, but I was just wondering whether that's also reflected, uh, whether the value of exports is also reflected in other states and whether it's a timing issue and whether there's sort of anything, uh, like a delay between when the harvest happens and when the exports get shipped out. Simon? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. It's probably um, at a level of detail that's uh, beyond me, but if you come down later, um, I can put you in touch with someone who can answer that, one of our analysts. Um, but you're right, there is certainly um, a lag between the production and the exports. Um, I'm not sure how that varies between ports, but um, come down afterwards and we can have a bit of a yarn. Chris? Oh, you got one up there? Well, Chris, you see? Uh, white shirt is there. Sorry, are you, you want to go next? Yeah. All right. All right. Chris Sound, Special Cropping Group. Question for Matt. Um, is it the stage where every morning the grower gets the uh, AI email saying if you sell the grain? grain today, this is your optimised price that we've worked out and almost, yeah, I suppose the grain marketing is using the, uh, the power of computing to actually do the complicated stuff? Uh, 
yeah, uh, it could go that way. I think more likely, though, we're going from the optimising bit, in, and I think Ben spoke about machine learning, so we're going from the optimising what we do know and making that as good as we can, and now I think the next bit is going to the next stage, which is there's a lot of data around the place from a lot of different sources. We've got to be able to connect the grower farms through the logistics network, the supply network, marrying that up with how we're going to store it effectively to the marketplace and deliver it to the marketplace and give the growers the opportunity to be not just a price taker. So I think as that data, as, as the world moves on and people become less stringent in controlling their own data, we'll see that coming and connecting. There will be machine learning passing over the top to give us more intelligence, but as far as it going all the way through, I mean, that sort of high frequency trading has been going on forever and I think there'll be a movement not towards that from growers but in the marketplace. But definitely, it'll be the connection of all the data and stripping out costs, all the costs. And if you're someone in the supply chain that's not really making value today, I think you're going to fall away really quickly through technology. But there are people doing legitimate tasks in that supply chain that will be shared amongst everyone. It will bubble in different areas over the years, but we will get rid of the, the people that aren't adding value. Machine learning will come in and give us a lot more control about what we're doing. The pricing will be the pricing ultimately. I mean, the, our research also shows that there's just a glut globally. We're not going to change that. In fact, if anything, we'll add to it. So. That's not working, I don't think. Oh, anyway, sorry, I might just yell. Yep. Um, I, I, my question was just related to... It's working. To it's working. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, my That's question it. is just related to the one before, um, and I might come down and have a chat to you later, um, just also about the winter crops coming through and when they're getting exported. I was just kind of wondering if how long um, those winter crops could be stored in inventories for. So if there's high stocks at the moment, how long can they be stored for and therefore before they get exported? Yep. So with a quality storage and handling provider like ourselves, <laughs> uh, looks, you know, I, from my experience back when I was in grain quality, we certainly had stocks that were going out uh, in, in very good health even three years later. So it's not a get it in, get it out quickly type of thing. Some of the on-farm storage stuff, like in the sausage bags or solo bags, those things have got a very small lifespan, but you know, that will improve in technology as well. Uh, I think people will get better at storing it for longer. Certainly grain can hold its, you know, quality for a long, long time if it's stored properly, so it's not a get it out. W one thing we've seen in, in the West is um, a, a definitive move from pools to cash. There is a lot more grain being sold for cash. Growers are able to hold their grain for longer. It's all about cash flow as far as I can tell, so once they've got their cash flow and they're able to, to store it for longer, um, they're, they're being really choosy on when they sell. What they can't do is put a price in the market. That's the only, that's the next step. But the grain can store for a long time. Richard, Richard Heath. Richard Heath, Australian Farm Institute and also a GRDC sponsored Nuffield Scholar from many years ago. Um, we heard from Alistair that uh, we're going to have to rely on productivity growth for, to, uh, for increased profits for the next five years. Um, I'd like to know from Ben, uh, as a producer, where he sees that productivity growth is going to come from, how much that uh, digital perhaps is going to contribute to that. Um, and then I think perhaps that uh, we shouldn't let Steve get off too lightly, and I'd like to have a comment from Steve from GRDC's perspective about where that productivity growth is going to come from as well. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think there will be... So I've been back on the farm for about five, six years now, and a lot of our productivity growth in the last few years on our farm has been actually been uh, a variety of changes in planting time, uh, to be honest. There is a lot of agronomy um, uh, change that can be made uh, across the... All of Australia's farming uh, areas, I think, in a lot of farms to Im improve their um, productivity and, and lift that. Um, after that, I think there is there is space inside this uh, digital realm to increase our productivity. Um, like I mentioned there, it, reducing your inputs where they're not required. It's hard to um, 
uh, to, to do that all the time. Like at the moment, we're putting out our highest rate of preprint urea that we ever had because it holds in the soil quite well and it's very cheap at the moment. So <laughs> it's like it's one of those things that we're not using the digital technology at the moment to reduce our urea input because it's it's quite a cheap input at the moment, like um, value for money. But the upside is that if we have another fantastic season, we're poised to grow a a really high high quality crop, high protein, high yield because we've we've gone ahead and taken the risk with the really high input. So I think there's part of um, understanding uh, your risk profile as well, which is what that comes to, and, and taking bigger risks to try and get those bigger rewards. Um, uh, but then also looking at smarter ways to maybe use some of these uh, chemicals that are still on patent in a that are quite expensive, uh, contr controlling our in-crop weeds and that sort of thing in a more in a, in a smarter way, which will reduce our uh, input costs, um, but also allow us to control those those weeds and overall improve our productivity. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've got a quick answer to that too. One of them is. Uh, just creating benchmarking is a simple one, right? So there is a, a, a vast degree of good growers to, to poor growers, and if we can raise everybody's standard of production just by knowing, you know, when you're at the bar, everyone's the best grower in the world, but if you can give people anonymously a way to benchmark themselves, maybe share practices digitally, I think that will rise the tide for everyone. It's got a limit to how far it will go, but that's a simple way that a digital economy can bring everyone up to speed quicker. And I think there's still a lot of cost to come out of the system as well. You, reckon, you still want me to get knock it off? Um, yeah, look, uh, productivity gains from a GRDC perspective, look, I, I, th I think there are a lot. Um, I think we're barely uh, only really starting to see the, the benefits of uh, a large investment in genetic technologies right across the board. I think rates of genetic gain are unprecedented today, uh, and uh, there's a lot of crops that, that, as an industry, that we've hardly even started investing in. If you look at wheat, uh, there's been activities going on for 130 years. What about chickpeas and lentils uh, and, and other crops of that nature? And then you look at farming systems, all the way through farming systems, you see some novel ways that people are, are getting much better pr productivity out of uh, very hostile soils. You're looking at crop protection and how you can how you can get better uh, disease and uh, crop loss uh, uh, or less crop loss. Uh, there's lots of innovation in terms of uh, managing weeds that can improve, improve productivity. And, uh, and I think in the, in the space of, uh, uh, I guess, in, in a collective word of precision farming, let's call it, we're just doing farming much better on a, on a, with much better information. We'll be able to look for rather than broad scale productivity, isolated or niche productivity gains across an enterprise that overall will lift, lift the gains and that's where the digital ag, ag platforms will really uh, come into play. Uh, I could go on for another half an hour if you like but uh, we'll leave it to somebody else. So. Thanks Steve. Uh, Nick Bryant from Grain Growers here in Canberra. Uh, quick comment for Ben. Uh, congratulations and well done on setting up your business mode. It's uh, very innovative and it's effective and relevant. Uh, I don't mind saying that, even though it competes with some of the products that grain growers offer. So well done. Keep going. It keeps Good plug, Nick. Toes. <laughs> but a uh, question probably for you and, and for Matt um, in particular. Just wondering whether you've, you've uh, afforded yourself the opportunity to think 10, 15 years ahead in the ag tech space, and if so, what sort of things come to mind? You've just been to again, right? uh, Yep, so I'll go first. And again, I think... Ben's work tonight was a fantastic presentation. So, and young innovators need to be given the capital that they need to, to push their businesses forward. So we just went and did a tour of Silicon Valley and the one thing that struck me was uh, in Australia, we should be very proud of the stuff that we've got. We've got a lot of really good advanced uh, technologies here. Our precision farming is, is certainly far in advance of a lot of other places in the world. Unfortunately, we're growing stuff in sand, they're growing stuff in topsoil. So. We're going to have to be ahead of the game forever. Yeah, we've had a bit of a look into the future as well. Machine learning's coming, right? So one of the satellite companies that Ben put up on the screen there is Planet Labs. We went and had a chat to Planet. They are fantastic. They just launched 88 satellites, 760 in the sky. It's the cadence of what they're going to be giving us. So if they're going to give us an image every single day, all of a sudden you can do predictive analysis across that crop. I mean, that's where we're going to focus our, 
attention now is how can we predict the crop better after we've got that stuff in place and if we can somehow solve the internet connectivity to the bush, which I think is a real problem, if we can get Internet of Things stuff out in the paddock, business grade, internet comms to you know, the farmhouse or the shed or wherever it might be, and connect all this stuff up, the next 10 years will be about how do we get all the growers, all the marketplace as productive and efficient as possible. There's a lot of really smart decision making tools that are in pockets that will get connected. The, the, you know, when we spoke about will the AI give you the ability to give you the price, no, but it will give you the mix of crop that you need to produce to get a sustainable return. I'm convinced that will come. It'll just tell you what's the cash target over the next five years, here's the crop you've got to predict to, to put it in. That'll come. Ten years, easy. Mike. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Oh, did Ben. ben. Oh, oh, sorry, Ben. No, I agree completely. I, I think the challenge is the um, the user inter uh, like the user interface with it all. Like, how do we get the the growers or the agronomists, or whoever's going to be the ones that are um, sure we can have our machine learning, artificial, artificial intelligence to, to to give us all this this information and um, forecasting and that, that sort of thing. But um, taking that information and and um, I guess. The extension officer of the past who went out and explained the new technology, the new varieties, the new chemicals, you know, maybe, maybe that's something like that needs to exist to go out and explain, you know, this is the new technology that's available and how you can make more money out of it on your farm and grow the industry that way. So I think there needs to be some sort of, that needs to be thought through as well. And one other thing, robotics. Robotics is coming yeah. really quickly. You know, the no we've had no seed tractors for a long time. Yeah. That, you know, we do have some regulatory hurdles we've got to get over, but that will be out there. We may even have seen the, the large vehicles we've got, maybe the largest they'll ever be. We may see smaller but more autonomous vehicles. I don't know, but it'll be autonomous and there'll be productivity gains there too. Yeah, Michael South and also grain growers. Um, Matt, quality optimisation is a great tool and it's delivered great results for growers. Um, however, not all growers are going to use it or they can use it either through connectivity issues or whatever. But as a, as a, a top performing bulk handling company and with a mandate to maximise returns to growers, do you maximise or optimise those loads that growers don't optimise? And if you do, do you pass the benefits back to growers in the cooperative model anyway? So no, so I mean, no, most growers do optimise. It's easy to push that button. And if they can't do it on the computer, they ring up our grower service centre and they push the button for them. So just about every grower does it. Um, most people will know there's shrink in the system to accommodate you know, losses and, and the rest of it. And normally a bulk handle will use some of that shrink to use in its profit, which then ultimately goes back to growers. We don't. We use our shrink to help manage the buffer between what the growers have optimised and what we're trying to sell to the marketplace. So very little outside of QO goes anywhere but the grower. What we have done, though, is trying to work on our supply chain logistics now. That's the next bit. How do you optimise your supply chain to deliver the best product the most efficiently? And that will get married up very quickly, I think, to crop prediction and what's where and where is it going next. I could be wrong on this, Matt, but um, I understand that uh, you've had to tighten up your specifications of what grain you can, you can actually put into quality optimisation. What's the rationale behind that? So, yes, they did tighten that up. That's because of the size of the crop that we've had and we've had limited opportunity to store it exactly the way we'd want to. So the moment you start blending crop together, you've, you start to lose a bit of quality which eats into the shrink. So really it's about, did we have the ability to get out to the marketplace what they want? Because the last thing we want is for the growers to get some perceived value that gets eroded away in price. We don't want that. We've created an environment where there's 30 odd marketers competing for grain in Western Australia which is keeping the price at a good sustainable level. So we want to protect both the marketplace and the grower. Great. On that note, we're now two minutes over time. So I will uh, hold it up there. I'd really like you to uh, thank our three uh, very, very accomplished uh, speakers uh, here today and also yourselves for uh, some great interaction and uh, uh, insightful questions. So thank you very much.